Scientists predict a massive hurricane is overdue to hit New York City. 130 mile an hour winds, debris choked storm surge, damage in the billions of dollars, fatalities in the hundreds, if not thousands. A mega disaster. A hurricane in the New York metropolitan area is far more dangerous than anywhere in the United States. Many New Yorkers are unaware that what happened to New Orleans could happen to them. It can. 67 years before Katrina, a killer hurricane smashed into New York and New England. It is still one of the deadliest hurricanes to make landfall in the United States. Using historical records and the latest meteorological predictions, we'll go inside the eye of a killer hurricane as it hits one of the greatest cities in the world. City. A humid Thursday in September. Commuters clog the financial district. Cabbies fight for fares outside Penn Station. It could be any fall day in the world's most vibrant city. But it's not. A devastating Category 3 hurricane is headed for New York. Most people in the North think of hurricanes as things that happen to people on warm palm fringe coasts. The historical record clearly tells us that this is not so. Northern hurricanes are more infrequent, but when they come, they're catastrophic. Tropical depressions often move across the Atlantic Ocean from West Africa. If one of these depressions expands and becomes a tropical storm as it moves east toward the United States, the National Hurricane Center in Miami will start to monitor the storm around the clock. It's very hard to be mentally prepared for something that happens relatively infrequently, but can have such significant consequences. With little warning, this tropical storm could develop into a hurricane and shift course, pick up wind speed, and head north to New York City. This is no theory. This is fact. This could be one of the worst disasters America will ever confront. We could see storm surge elevations of about 30 feet, which means that we have a serious uh, amount of uh, population that we need to get out of the hazard area. This storm surge will rush the city in a raging torrent of wind, rain, and waves. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when and how big. It will begin like this. A Bermuda high pressure system will lock in close to the shore. A continental high will move in from the west. The large hurricane will be caught in the jet stream. New York will have no more than a day and a half's warning. Our challenge in this situation is to match up the timing of the approaching storm, take those hours that we know that we need to, to get the job done, and kind of put a timeline together that makes sure that we get everything accomplished before that storm makes landfall. As a major urban area of over 20 million people, there is a limit to how New York can prepare for one of the world's most deadly mega disasters we can see the additional problems that a catastrophe brings in an urban environment versus a more rural environment. 120,000 cars pass through the Lincoln Tunnel every day. There are seven million daily subway riders. They may not be able to get out. In the event of a weekday mega hurricane, Manhattan could become a waterlogged prison. The challenge for us is, is that there's never been an evacuation of really any kind in the city of New York. Police, fire, FEMA, Coast Guard, 
the city calls for all hands on deck. By 1 a.m. on the day of the storm, the National Hurricane Center will put out a hurricane warning for the northeast coast. In this area, hurricanes tend to be very fast moving. So a storm could look like it's not headed toward the northeast and then suddenly make a turn and quickly start moving in our direction. It doesn't seem possible that this fortress of marble and steel could be vulnerable to wind and rain, but it is. According to our estimates, the two cities or the two metropolitan areas along the U.S. coastline where we could see total economic damages in excess of $250 billion from a hurricane are Miami and New York. And they're really two separate factors. One is the nature of the hurricane that'll be hitting. That's the northern hurricane that moves two to three times faster and is immense in size. Then there's the nature of the area. We have a very gentle continental shelf, which allows us to build up huge amounts of surge level. The area most vulnerable to that storm surge is in the right angle formed by the shorelines of New Jersey and New York. This region is known as the New York Bight. When you have a right angle like this, and you have a hurricane rotating counterclockwise, it's pushing water into that right angle, and there's no place for it to go. So it pours into Jamaica Bay, and it pours into New York Harbor to abnormally high heights. Friday, rush hour. After 36 hours of making its way up the coast, the hurricane reaches New York City. The roaring storm is now 200 miles wide, with an eye wall that measures 20 miles across. Winds at the center of the right eye wall swirl counterclockwise at over 150 miles an hour. Hundreds of homes along the water's edge in New Jersey and Long Island are destroyed. In the outer boroughs, single-family homes suffer severe roof damage from the intense pressure. Hundreds of thousands of commuters are stranded. JFK Airport is inundated by 28 feet of surging water. The storm barrels past the Statue of Liberty and hits Manhattan at high tide. A 26-foot storm surge engulfs the southern tip of Manhattan. Abandoned taxis and buses are swamped in Battery Park. 130 mile an hour winds rip debris from every rooftop in the city. The subways fill with corrosive salt water and grind to a halt. There will be trees down, there will be roof damage, there will be window and cladding damage. And you can't go down to your local ATM and get any money. Most of the stores aren't gonna be open. There's no electricity, so a lot of things that we take for granted are not going to be available. But there is one variable in this doomsday equation, the New Yorker. There is no doubt there still is a complacency factor. Um, you know, people still do not believe uh, that hurricanes are prevalent in this area. We've been to many communities where there are residents who continue to tell us they will not evacuate. And these are the people that will remain in harm's way. So we could experience fatalities um, or injuries. The lull during the middle of the storm's landfall will be a dangerous midpoint for New Yorkers. Skies clear. It may appear the worst is over. It's not. This brief respite is followed by an incredibly fast-moving surge that drowns anyone in its path. The worst winds and surge start to subside. But police and firefighters are still crippled by flooding and dangerous electrical and gas lines. The deadly Category 3 storm will be the most shocking event to hit the city since 9-11. But this mega disaster will come as no surprise to scientists and emergency management officials. It's going to happen. It's going to happen at any time. September 21st, 1938. A hurricane nicknamed the Long Island Express rammed into the south shore of Long Island, New York at 2.30 in the afternoon. Within hours, over 700 people were dead. 
more than 50,000 people were left homeless. The storm of 38 is one of the worst hurricanes of the century, an event almost forgotten today. But hidden within this mega disaster are secrets that may condemn today's New York or save it. Experts believe a Category 3 hurricane could devastate New York City in the near future. When this killer storm comes, there will be massive power outages and loss of life. Debris-filled water will flood lower Manhattan. Fierce winds will rip apart buildings. Water is backed up about a foot. For many New Yorkers, it will seem inconceivable that a killer storm could hit this far north. But storms have plagued the Northeast for hundreds of years. The great colonial hurricane occurred in uh, 1635 and was a complete surprise to the English settlers who had never seen a hurricane before. Damage was recorded in the Providence Plantations, in the Plymouth Colony, and in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Major hurricanes also hit New York and New England in the 1900s. But the storm that struck Long Island on September 21st, 1938, would define the destructive potential of a New York City hurricane. The 1938 hurricane was a horrific event. People on Long Island did not even understand the word hurricane. It had sustained winds of around 120 miles an hour with gusts to over 150 miles an hour. With 48 states as the scene of... In 1938, meteorology was a much more primitive science. There was no Doppler radar. The only protection against these storms was individual storm trackers watching the sky and sea. The hurricane was headed toward Miami, but at 7 o'clock, storm trackers in Jacksonville, Florida, observed that the storm had started to veer north. The churning wall of water and wind reached Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, a day later. A high-pressure system off the coast and one along the Alleghenies created a chute for the storm to fly up the shoreline. One of the factors surrounding the surprise attack of the storm was the lack of eyewitness data and information. We used to get a lot of information from ship data, and they had ability to go from ship to ship to shore. During the 38th storm, I think a lot of what happened was is the ships got out of the way. You know, they're not stupid. There was not much information that was gathered. One of the largest hurricanes in recorded history was moving up the coast, and nobody knew it was coming. In 1938, meteorologists believed that the colder water temperatures of the North Atlantic were incompatible with the energy needed to produce a hurricane. A common fallacy in thinking about hurricanes in the North is that the cold water north of the Gulf Stream protects us. It all depends on how fast the hurricane is moving forward. If a hurricane is moving forward 35 miles an hour or more, as it leaves the Gulf Stream, it's like a car out of control and it's going to hit New York and Long Island with undiminished force. Richard Hendrickson was 18 years old in 38. A native Long Islander, he was a weather observer for the U.S. Weather Bureau, as well as working on his father's farm. I woke up that morning and did the morning chores with the young baby chicks and so forth. At 2.30 in the afternoon, the storm hit Long Island. Forward speed was 60 miles an hour, with sustained winds of 120 miles per hour and gusts of over 150. The worst conditions were over the eastern part of Long Island. The Hamptons saw surges between 15 and 20 feet of water come in over the dunes and just envelop many of the towns on the east end. Few people actually saw the wall of surge coming toward them and managed to live. Water filled with deadly debris pummeled dunes and buildings. Onlookers tried to flee to higher ground ahead of the roaring storm. It covered a tremendous area of Long Island, which is another devastating characteristic of northern hurricanes. They expand and they move faster as they come north. 
Each cubic yard of seawater carried the deadly weight of 1,700 pounds as the surge hammered to pieces massive summer homes. It took the sand dunes and the beach right out and made an opening between Shinnecock Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. And I went down to check the buildings. We had 25 buildings in six acres, and all the buildings were smashed. The chickens were blown against the five-foot wire fence and drowned with the wind and the rain. A good man would go in the corn lot and cry. The howling storm charged across Long Island Sound and smacked Connecticut and Rhode Island in the face. At rush hour, the storm crashed into downtown Providence, Rhode Island, then a city of 250,000. One witness described the surge pushing water from the bay into downtown was as if someone had turned on a giant water faucet. People were clinging to lampposts. They drowned in their cars. Plate glass windows of department stores popped out. Sofas and washing machines floated by with people riding them like lifeboats. A sporting goods store pushed its inventory of small rowboats out the second story window. Within hours, the same hurricane also wreaked havoc in Massachusetts and Vermont. Because it was so fast moving and so large, affected thousands of square miles, and it downed over two billion trees and affected lots of properties all the way up inland into Worcester, Massachusetts. Every single property on Long Island was had some damage from this storm. There was low-level wind damage all the way up into Canada. Over 60,000 people were left homeless from the 1938 hurricane. The widespread devastation is vividly captured in this extremely rare 1938 color film. Almost 700 people were killed. Thousands were injured. To this day, it is still one of the largest hurricanes to strike the United States. 70 years later, it is almost forgotten. Many historians feel the reason the hurricane has been overlooked is because on that same day, September 21st, 1938, Adolf Hitler annexed Czechoslovakia. Within a year, Europe would be engulfed in war. But to the New Yorkers and New Englanders who survived the hurricane, the storm was no less devastating an attack than Hitler's invasion. But this storm did have one positive impact on the economy. At that time, you could get anybody to work for $2 a day. People had to have their doors fixed, their chimney rebuilt, the trees out. I like to say that that was the end of the Depression. In the decades since this mega disaster, there has been tremendous development along the East Coast. For example, in 1938, the entire population of Long Island was less than 750,000. Today, more than 3 million live there. There are 20 million people in the surrounding area, all at risk. We have to remember no major hurricane has hit an American coastal urban center. Andrew did not hit Miami, it hit Homestead. Hugo did not hit Charleston, it hit the Isle of Palms. Even the Eye of Katrina actually made landfall in nearby Mississippi, not New Orleans. But what would happen if New York City were directly targeted? The 1938 hurricane would only be a dress rehearsal for a far greater catastrophe. The 1938 hurricane produced enough lumber from downed trees to build 200,000 homes. New York City is staring down the barrel of a gun. A catastrophic hurricane could hit at any time. But wind, rain, and flooding are nothing new to the Big Apple. In fact, New York has a long history of storms. In 1938, a Category 3 storm overwhelmed parts of New York and New England. 
The hurricane missed a direct hit on New York City by less than 75 miles. Winds of 60 to 70 miles an hour were recorded in Central Park. In 1985, New York experienced its closest call with Hurricane Gloria. Gloria was a Category 3 storm that started in the Carolinas and moved north through New Jersey, causing massive flooding. Meteorologists and emergency management experts warned New York to prepare for the worst. But the worst never came. We were watching this storm very closely on the radar, and we watched the whole back part of Gloria fall apart. Hurricane Gloria broke up as it passed over the cold northern waters. By the time it reached New York, most of the winds had decreased to Category 1. There was a small swath of 15 to 20 miles over Suffolk County that did see sustained Category 2 type winds. It was very easy to survive Hurricane Gloria. And yet, parts of Long Island lost power for seven days. Despite $900 million in damage and destruction as far south as North Carolina, New York City had dodged the bullet. We've been very lucky a couple of times over the last few years. Go back to 1999 and we look at Floyd as it was coming up the coast as it came off of the Virginia Capes. It was no longer a hurricane. We breathed a sigh of relief because that was pretty damn close to us. Isabel, 2003, another one. It hit down in the Carolinas, but slowly made that northwest turn and we had damage all the way up into southern Jersey, a couple of hundred miles to the north. That same type of storm, that would have affected significantly New York City. These are the things that have happened during this 95 to 2005 period that we just have been lucky. Statistics and weather data indicate the next big storm could be less forgiving. To begin with, both the Gulf and the Atlantic Basin have recently seen fluctuations in water temperature. We're in the multi-decadal cycle of warm surface temperatures of the Atlantic. We can go back to about 1870, and we see a cycle of every 25 to 30 years, we go through temperatures which are warmer than normal for about 25 to 30 years, and then colder than normal. These warmer, colder, and wetter, drier cycles may have been exacerbated by global warming. Because of global warming, because of our rising sea level, well, warmer ocean waters in the future, and I like to say the near future, we are going to have a severe hurricane. But it is not just the frequency of these hurricanes during the current warm period that is causing concern. There has also been tremendous construction along the coast during the last cold water period. We went through a period from the mid-60s to the mid-90s where the Atlantic Basin was a little bit below normal as far as water temperature goes. Now that's when the coast was developed and people didn't have the hurricane experience. Tremendous coastal buildup a complacent population, increasing hurricane activity, a deadly mix for New York City. But until 15 years ago, scientists' best guess was that the Northeast only experienced these larger hurricanes every 150 years or so. That means the city would not be due for a major storm until around 2075. But that thinking changed after a few pieces of pottery were found on a New York City beach in 1995. We're in the Auburn section of Rockaway, part of New York's public beach system. And not many New Yorkers know that after the Civil War, out there, 1,000 feet, was a resort island called Hog Island. And it had causeways and uh, playhouses and saloons and restaurants. The area just offshore was dredged after a series of winter storms in the early 1990s. The sand was dumped on this beach in Rockaway, Brooklyn. She has a brick, a remnant of a brick. In 1995, Professor Nick Koch and his geology students were collecting sand and stone along this shoreline. What they found would change both the history and the future of hurricane prediction in New York. My students and I, after the ocean was dredged, 
found this material, artifacts, on the beach, and in the process of dating it, we rediscovered the great 1893 hurricane that devastated the shoreline of New York. Dr. Koch's students were able to cross-reference the items they found on the beach and determine a period in the early 1890s when it was possible that all these different artifacts could have been in the same location. The 1893 storm was forgotten, but it's very clear in the New York Times, all six columns of the front page talk about the extreme devastation that occurred on the New York shoreline. Hog Island was completely destroyed by the 1893 hurricane. Oh, Edgar, what do you think? It's With the rediscovery of this Category 2 storm, Professor Koch now understood that New York area storms were much more frequent than previously believed. We began to narrow the recurrence interval of a major storm on the New York shoreline to something more like 75 to 90 years, from 125 to 150 years. In this year, we realize that we're running close to the statistical recurrence of a hurricane. Where it will be, we don't know, but it could be almost overdue. And the storms of the recent past give strong hints about the size of the damage to come. The October 91 perfect storm. Water during this storm pounds New York, and the PATH train tunnel fills with water. Swells of 10 to 30 feet crash into the shore from North Carolina to Nova Scotia. Fall of 93 and spring of 94, huge nor'easters slam into New York City, dumping more rain and pushing high winds across the five boroughs. More than 50 motorists have to be rescued by dive teams on the FDR drive. The February blizzard of 2006. 26.9 inches of snow paralyzed the city, the largest snowfall in the recorded history of New York. The near misses are getting closer, and when a Category 3 storm does hit, New Yorkers will not have to look far to see the potential consequences. Katrina. The reverberations of this killer hurricane that devastated the Gulf region are still being felt today. Katrina took a very bad track. It hit a major populated area, so it was a very deadly hurricane because it had strong winds, it had high storm surge, it was very large, and it hit very populated areas along the coastline. The Katrina statistics are stunning. Over 1,600 confirmed fatalities, $80 billion in losses and counting, 80% of a major urban population displaced interstate highways destroyed, a cultural center of the United States left in ruins. And that is the lesson of Hurricane Katrina for people in the Northeast and New York City, that because intense hurricanes can be large, can impact major metropolitan areas, these mega catastrophes will happen. Katrina was a deadly wake-up call to emergency management experts, politicians, and the public. But is New York City listening? 26-foot storm surge. 20 inches of driving rain. Killer 130-mile-per-hour winds. Meteorological estimates predict a Category 3 storm could leave New York City under siege. But before a hurricane can attack one of America's most vital and important cities, it will quietly begin life thousands of miles away in Africa. A hurricane basically, as it starts out, it's a wave, it's a buckle in the tropical easterlies. And what happens is, as that buckle starts to move from east to west, it develops some disturbances. A disturbance is a small area of low pressure. As these disturbances move across the Atlantic, they pick up more energy as warm water evaporates and is sucked up into the clouds. After 24 hours, these disturbances start to form into clusters of thunderstorms. If a low pressure system develops along these thunderstorms, you're going to start to see a depression. A depression is a region of low barometric pressure. 
as that depression intensifies and the winds intensify to tropical storm strength, 39 miles an hour or greater, it becomes a tropical storm. Winds in this type of depression start to pick up as the size of the thunderstorms increase. Once those winds increase, that low pressure has sustained winds around it of 74 miles an hour or greater, it becomes a hurricane. As a hurricane like this works its way up the coast, knocking out power and causing flooding, the biggest problem awaiting New York City is going to be coastal storm surge. A lot of people don't consider New York a coastal a city, but we do have 478 miles of coastline here. And everyone should understand that no matter where on Long Island a hurricane hits, New York City will get abnormal surge response from it. And as that surge dome comes into the land, on top of it are superimposed waves that are formed from the wind. Surge levels can be predicted by a slosh model. Slosh stands for sea, lake, and overland surge from hurricanes. In this slosh model for a category three hurricane moving northwest over northern New Jersey and placing the right eye wall over New York City, the storm surge at Jamaica Bay could be 28 feet. Along the Brooklyn waterfront, it could top 20 feet. Wall Street surge levels could rise to 18 feet. Here we are at the southernmost point of New York City, what we call the Battery, and here's where the surge is going to first affect the land. And the, the winds driving the water into the right angle between New York and New Jersey will push water through the narrows into this bay. Sea levels have risen a foot and a half since the early 19th century. At high tide, a surge of this size could be at least 18 feet for a mere Category 2 hurricane. The storm surge will roll in with such power that small structures along the coastline will be totally leveled. As water smashes into doors and windows, it will create and collect more debris. People think that hurricane winds and hurricane waters are pure. They are not. They're full of the debris that the hurricane has come down. So rather than water or air hitting you, you feel like a battering ram. And story after story in every hurricane has shown that many people have died directly from being smashed by the debris. Some people who live maybe five miles inland on Flatbush Avenue don't realize that they are in a storm surge inundation area. They're five miles from the coast. In the right situation, there could be some sort of level of storm surge there. The storm surge in New York will create unique problems that other cities have never had to face. Here we are on the subways, which are one of New York's greatest assets, but also a source of great concern during a severe storm. Our subway tunnels flood in fresh water when we have nor'easter storms, and in a hurricane, we'll actually have salt water in the system, and that will do corrosion in addition to submerging it. Salt water is a challenge. Uh, when the subway was designed, I'm sure it was not planned to be filled with salt water. Um, obviously, any electric components, the switching and the wiring will be affected by salt water. Storm surge will not be the only danger New Yorkers face. There will be significant amount of wind damage from a major hurricane hitting New York. Even though New York City itself is populated with large, high-rise, very substantial buildings that are not going to topple over in a major hurricane, these buildings will still experience extensive damage. Even if the storm is a Category 3 storm on the typical height that these wind speeds are measured, which is about 10 meters, as you get higher, the wind speeds increase. So if at the ground we're experiencing a Category 3 hurricane, a skyscraper is experiencing a Category 5 wind. The real danger from wind is debris. I think the principal concern for New York when that happens will be objects on the roof that aren't tied down, air conditioner systems, water tanks. The rooftops of New York harbor a deadly arsenal of airborne missiles, ready to rain down on every sidewalk and street. You see water towers, construction cranes, and other microwave towers on top of the buildings. In Brooklyn, Queens and Long Island, 
there will be other wind-related problems. Wood frame buildings in a strong Cat 3, Cat 4 can suffer complete collapse. Initially, equal pressure on the inside and outside of a house will keep the building from collapsing. But if the wind breaks the windows, then that pressure is transmitted to the interior, sucking that wind into the building. The pressure from the outside pushes it in as well. Together, they create a critical mass. This pressure pushes at the roof of the building, forcing it up. When the negative pressure created by the wind blowing over the exterior is added to this equation, the roof can blow right off. With storm surge and wind battering New York City, infrastructure will also begin to fall apart. As Katrina demonstrated, that damage will be unbelievable. Many roads will be washed out, and you will have lots of businesses who will be obviously shut down for extended periods of time, so there'll be lots of loss of income. It'll be hard for people to get back into work, even when the storm has passed. But it's not an entirely hopeless scenario. New York has evacuation advantages over other cities. Because the elevation level rises quickly within the city limits, residents will need to walk just a short distance to higher ground, not drive the 50 or 60 miles that we have seen choke highways in other evacuations. And if they prepare properly, and heed the evacuation order, these are survivable uh, events. Preparedness comes through anticipation and rehearsal. But how does New York rehearse for such an unpredictable event? Category 4 or 5 North Atlantic hurricanes have increased 56% over the last 35 years. Seven a.m., New York City. A beautiful September morning sometime in the future. The National Hurricane Center has watched a storm off the coast of Florida turn and head north overnight. The storm is massive, with a radius of more than 100 miles across and an eye wall of 12 miles, and it's rapidly expanding. Once a hurricane reaches Miami, it's no more than a day and a half away from New York City. That day is today. A devastating Category 3 hurricane is about to batter New York City with deadly force. The countdown has begun. So what we're going to see is when that hurricane moves to Cape Hatteras, we're only six to eight hours away, but yet on Long Island, the sky's gonna look very good. Once the hazard is identified, regardless of intensity, it could be a tropical depression that's gonna make a direct landfall all the way to a major hurricane. And the city will begin to coordinate internally. But people are gonna notice that huge waves are coming in. And then the huge waves are gonna continue and their nature is gonna change. And then the sky over three hours is gonna become dark. And if you've waited to this time, it's too late to get out. At this point, New Yorkers have only a few options. Move away from any area exposed to water below 30 feet in elevation. Stay away from windows. Go to the interior stairwell of your building and hunker down. At three hours, we're going to be experiencing extremely heavy surf and gale force winds. So it's going to be getting darker and darker. Rain is going to start to fall. The rain will become more and more horizontal with time. Then the front part of the hurricane will move in and the devastating phase goes on. Rush hour, the category three mega hurricane hits town. The strongest winds and storm surge are on the right side of the hurricane slamming into the harbor. The surge will come up slowly at first, and then as that eye makes landfall, it'll just come up as a big wave, inundate from Coney Island on right up into the southern tip of Manhattan. A tsunami-like wall of water will smash into every inch of the coast. 
These deadly surges will first devastate outlying coastal areas of the city. As the hurricane continues north, surge levels will build. The financial district in lower Manhattan could see water as far north as Canal Street. The current home of the city's Office of Emergency Management is vulnerable, located in a flood zone near the Brooklyn Bridge. Icons begin to fall. Water levels at the battery start to rise at more than a foot an hour. The water seeps in through every drain and tunnel entrance, flooding subway tracks and bringing mass transit to a halt. Our utility system is underground, very susceptible to storm surge. In Times Square, swirling winds of over 100 miles an hour send neon and glass spinning everywhere. Solid masonry buildings like the Empire State Building and modern steel high-rises stand fast against the storm, but their windows are pummeled and shattered by flying debris. At JFK Airport, Jamaica Bay swells to 28 feet, flooding the landing zones. On the outlying beaches, 22-foot storm surge and 130-mile-an-hour winds pummel single-family homes. Skies suddenly clear as the eye makes landfall. But this is only a lull before phase two hits. It will basically come up and come right back out as that eye makes landfall and moves, the winds will turn around as the storm moves past and push all the water back out, along with all the debris, and do a lot more damage as the water retreats. The storm charges into the suburban counties north of the city, wreaking more wind and water damage. Hopefully everybody will be sheltered uh, uh, in facilities that are safe. You know, there may be a period where there is a, a large loss of power, but uh, with the redundancies in place, we hope to limit that as much as possible. Ten hours later, the storm dissipates in light wind and rain over upstate New York and Canada. In New York City, rescue and cleanup operations are already underway. But it will take weeks to get the city back to normal. Citizens should expect to be on their own for up to 72 hours and make the provisions now to lessen that impact when it happens. Stranded motorists will be pulled from car roofs by Coast Guard and city police. The few survivors of the tsunami-like surges in beachfront communities will start to crawl out from the wreckage of their homes. A hit on a major city like New York will easily have national repercussions. There will not only be damage to the infrastructure, but there will be interruption of work, which will have tremendous economic consequences for the country as a whole. One scenario that we should be prepared for is a storm that is about the same intensity of the 1938 hurricane. And that type of event, again, the same intensity as the 1938, the same size, the same forward speed storm would cause insured damages in excess of $50 billion, but total economic damages well in excess of $100 billion. The tragic failures of Hurricane Katrina are another stark reminder of the high cost of ignoring this potential mega disaster. I think Katrina should have been a wake up call for everyone in this country as just how devastating these events can be. But experts and scientists are optimistic that New York can survive this doomsday scenario. Our values are getting better and better. We're getting much, much more accurate as far as our forecasts go with the uh, path of the storm. Newscasts will provide plenty of advance warning. The media sees these things. They're hyped up to death. So that's a, that's a fortunate thing in some ways. But no amount of warning can change one fact. A killer hurricane will one day hit New York City. A geologist understands from the first day of class that the coast is the fastest changing part of the continents. We're on a collision course with Mother Nature, and Mother Nature always wins.
In the vastness of space lurks a killer, an asteroid on a collision course with the Earth. It's a million in one chance, but many believe it has happened before. 65 million years ago, an asteroid ended the dinosaur's domination of the planet. The whole globe reduced to ash is just scary. Along with the dinosaurs, 70% of all living things on the planet died out. That's not just a mass kill, it's a mass extinction. And we may join the dinosaurs. In an instant, ancient history might be repeated. The whole sky would have just become a red glowing sheet of lava. A blast hundreds of thousands of times larger than an atomic bomb. The impact would be a catastrophe, a disaster that's absolutely unparalleled in human experience. Millions of lives lost in just minutes. It's more horrific than anything that we had previously imagined. Are we doomed to face the same fate as the dinosaurs? Or can we stop it in time? There is the ultimate threat of having our species extinguished by a huge monster asteroid coming in and hitting us. Southern California is no stranger to natural disasters. The area's 20 million residents have endured earthquakes, mudslides, and firestorms. But the deadliest threat may come from the sky. Although its arrival would be no surprise, there would be nowhere to run. Los Angeles would be transformed from a city into a bullseye. It's like a mountain running into the earth at the speed of a bullet. The impact is larger than a thousand Hiroshima's. It's going to be a gigantic explosion and blindingly brilliant and far brighter than the sun. The ensuing firestorm incinerates everything within a 100 mile radius. The massive pressures generate 300 mile per hour winds flattening what's left and the devastation continues. That all kinds of debris would fall on you, like being in Pompeii. In 60 seconds, Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, Malibu are gone. Then the final assault. Monstrous tsunamis more than 500 feet high rampage across the Pacific. Tsunami waves would propagate up and down the coast, uh, all the way to the tip of Baja, to Alaska, and uh, bigger than any waves no demand so far. By the time it's over, millions up and down the west coast of America have been killed. The impact would be a, would be a, a catastrophe, a disaster that's absolutely unparalleled in, in, in human experience. We are living on borrowed time. This is what we can expect from an asteroid impact if our luck doesn't hold out. We're gradually appreciating the fact that the Earth does take hits uh, fairly frequently. At the moment, there are 180 known impact craters etched into the surface of the Earth. The half-mile Wolf Creek Crater in Australia, the 60-mile Manicouagan Crater in Canada, and a recently discovered 19-mile-wide crater in the Sahara Desert represent the billion-year legacy of collisions with asteroids. Left over from the creation of the solar system, asteroids are the orphans of the universe. Millions orbit in a distinct belt between Jupiter and Mars. The asteroids are essentially the, the fossils of planetary formation, if you will. They are the small building block debris left over from the formation of the terrestrial planets. They can reach lengths of 500 miles and fly through space at nearly 40,000 miles per hour. These speeds are almost impossible to imagine, but if we were trying to explain that, imagine being in a plane moving at that speed. You could cross the continent from Los Angeles to New York City in just three or four minutes. Any one of them could hit the Earth with devastating consequences. Asteroids come around uh, at random. It's like a Las Vegas shooting gallery. Statistically, over time, we are more likely to die from an asteroid impact than from a tornado or tsunami. 
There is one reason for our good luck. Large asteroids rarely hit the Earth. The one that ended the age of the dinosaurs was 65 million years ago. Long before mammals, hundreds of species of these ancient animals, both large and small, roamed the globe. Pterosaurs sailed the skies. Ancient sharks ruled the seas. And the land was lush with a diversity of plants. Then suddenly, nearly three quarters of all living things were killed in one of the planet's worst mass extinctions. For years, scientists debated what caused the abrupt demise of the dinosaurs. But recent discoveries point to a killer asteroid that ended an era. The theory is a six-mile-wide asteroid struck the Earth near Chicxulub, Mexico. It's as if a mountain twice the size of Mount Everest fell from the sky. It smashed into the ocean with the power of 190 billion tons of TNT and left a crater 110 miles wide and five miles deep. This impacting asteroid came screaming at the Earth's surface in excess of 20,000 miles per hour. It would have appeared to you as if the sky was suddenly split by fire because the incoming object as it went through the Earth's atmosphere would have ionized a tremendous amount of gas in the Earth's atmosphere and essentially glowed. It would have looked like the sky was on fire. It hit the ocean just off the coast of Mexico. Ocean layer is just like the paper on a Christmas gift. It just is gone in a second. In fact, it blew away that layer and dug 30 kilometers deeper. We're talking digging a hole in the, in the rocks you know, 20 miles down. So it's a huge catastrophic event. It had an energy that's maybe 10 or 100,000 times more than all the energy and all the nuclear weapons on the Earth. The resulting fireball, brighter than a 1,000 suns, burned everything within 500 miles and reached beyond the Earth's atmosphere. A shock wave and tremendous air blast followed, creating winds exceeding 2,000 miles per hour. That pressure pulse and that wind had the capacity to completely destroy any plants and animals within a region of several hundred miles. The impact created tidal waves 150 feet tall, washing over much of southern North America. It shook the Earth for a 1,000 miles around, and, and that shaking created many secondary landslides in the ocean. And those secondary landslides also made tsunamis. So we have uh, tsunamis from the impact, we have tsunamis from the secondary landslide. So as if that wasn't enough, you also had the, uh, this impact ejecta, this rocky debris ejected out of the crater, come crashing back down onto the landscape, burying plants and animals that may have survived. In some cases, this debris was several hundred feet thick. The heat from impact caused trees to burst into flames. Wildfires devastated the landscape for hundreds of miles. If you were an animal, you likely would have passed out as the atmosphere around you became so hot, you would have dropped unconscious. The intense heat overwhelmed everything it touched. Now, as bad as this seems, as destructive as it would have been to the local Gulf of Mexico region, devastating life, it's not responsible for the mass extinction event that occurred 65 million years ago. It wasn't the explosion itself that wiped out all the dinosaurs. This was a global catastrophe, a catastrophe at a level we haven't seen in the last 200 million years. The initial devastation was limited to 600 miles from the blast zone. But most of the life on the planet was snuffed out. Why? A controversial new theory that attempts to answer that question also challenges our understanding of asteroids. And that understanding may mean the difference between life and death. Scientists believe that sooner or later, a large asteroid will hit our planet with devastating results. Their best evidence to the devastation is the global disaster that led to the disappearance of the dinosaurs. 65 million years ago, dinosaurs ruled supreme. Then it appears an asteroid struck the Earth near Chicxulub, Mexico, and they suddenly vanished. The impact happened in a matter of moments, and it changed the world literally overnight. Experts are still investigating exactly how the asteroid caused a worldwide extinction. The results may hold the secret to our own survival. 
It's a crime scene that is very cold. It happened 65.5 million years ago. Up through the 1970s, volcanoes were the prime suspects. One of the greatest periods of volcanic activity occurred around the time of the dinosaur's disappearance. It was thought that the volcanoes threw so much ash into the atmosphere that it shielded enough sunlight to dramatically cool the planet and to cause a mass extinction. In 1980, a new theory proposed that an asteroid impact, not volcanoes, caused the dramatic climate change that explains the extinction. But in each case, climate change didn't explain why certain species survived. The latest research, however, has spurred a new and controversial theory that debris ejected from Chicxulub created a worldwide inferno. The thing that was devastating globally was this two or 3,000 cubic kilometers of rock blasted into orbit. About 90% of it would come back down on the Earth. And when it hits the upper atmosphere, that friction creates an enormous amount of heat. The entire sky, instead of seeing little individual shooting stars, the whole sky would have just become a red glowing sheet of lava. For years, scientists thought this had happened only in the vicinity of the impact site. But the new theory proposes fires covered much of the planet and better explains why some species were extinguished and some survived. The sky would have turned about 1,200 degrees, about that color, which is about the color of the elements in the broiler of your oven. It's hot enough that on the surface of the Earth below, it would have ignited fires. So you would have gotten fires everywhere around the entire planet. The whole globe reduced to ash is just scary. The intense heat from the falling debris would destroy every living thing above ground. Any large exposed animal would immediately suffer burns all over his body and die, just like if you crawled into a broiler. The best chance for survival was to move underground, something only small animals could do. If you don't actually have a hole in the ground, you're going to be burned alive. These are parts of victims. These are bones of Triceratops and duckbilled dinosaurs and Tyrannosaurus rexes. Here is just one horn of a Triceratops, the famous horn dinosaur of the late Cretaceous. This is just the bony horn core. And we find these things all over the place in the end of the Cretaceous, the last several hundred feet of the Cretaceous layers of rocks. The Cretaceous period, the age of the dinosaurs, ends abruptly at one of the most significant moments in our planet's history, known as the KT boundary. The KT boundary is shorthand for the Cretaceous-Tertiary boundary, the dividing line between the age of dinosaurs and the age of mammals. The Cretaceous period went from 145 million years ago and it ended with a bang with the asteroid striking Mexico at 65.51 million years ago. Evidence of this geological dividing line can be found all over the world and in abundance on the plains of eastern Colorado. That is the KT boundary. This two centimeter thick layer came out of the sky. The excavation of the crater blew fragments of rock from Mexico to Colorado 65.5 million years ago. And one of the biggest asteroid impacts this planet has ever seen. Microscopic evidence in the clay, particles of rock that are shocked. The crystalline lattice has been crushed. Analyzing sediment from the KT layer, we find the pieces of shocked quartz, evidence of a powerful collision as well as remnants of the Earth's crust melted by the asteroid's impact. These unique findings suggest a borderline through which the dinosaurs did not pass. This is a Triceratops vertebra. This bone was found about four meters below the KT boundary. And one of the amazing things about dinosaurs is you always find them below the KT boundary, the debris horizon from the asteroid impact. Dinosaurs disappear from the terrestrial landscapes after the KT boundary. The lack of large dinosaur fossils above the KT boundary suggests just how the asteroid killed them off. These huge bones are typical of land animals found in the period before the Chicxulub impact. This is what's been found afterwards. This is typical of the size of jaw bones that you find afterwards, and you don't find anything much larger than this. These were the things that crawled out from burrows. If you ask 
What is it that was likely to have been sheltered underground or in the water at the time of this impact? It's mammals, turtles, lizards, snakes, alligators, crocodiles. It's an exact match for what made it through. Additional fossil evidence suggests large land animals were not the only ones struggling to survive at the KT boundary. We always hear about the dinosaurs. Big deal about the dinosaurs. The real cool stuff are the plants. Almost everything in these cabinets are plants that went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. Where before the KT boundary, there had been 50 or 70 species of plants growing here. And a site like this, which is only a few meters above the KT boundary, or only a few tens of thousands of years after the event, we're only finding five to eight species. That's not just a mass kill, it's a mass extinction. Like the animals that survived the asteroid's impact, the plants that endured past the KT boundary were protected from the heat. The one thing we can say about the plants that survived the KT boundary is that they were plants that lived in swamps during the Cretaceous. But millions of species of sea animals and plants were also killed, despite being protected from the heat by the ocean. Why? To complete that part of the puzzle, scientists point to more recent disasters. Ash clouds from volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo and Montserrat plunged the nearby areas into darkness. The Chicxulub impact likely had the same effect, but on a much larger scale. 12 hours after this starts, it'll become pitch black, and it'll probably stay pitch black for months. And pitch black means darker than a moonless night. I mean, you know, not even cats could see. The cloud of debris would have reached the upper atmosphere, spread around the globe, blocking sunlight from the Earth's surface. This type of asteroid would have contained several weight percent sulfur. That sulfur, when vaporized and it deposited in the Earth's atmosphere, would form what we call sulfate aerosols. These aerosols would have heated the upper atmosphere of the Earth while causing cooling at the surface of the Earth. The extended night and global cooling would have killed much of the sea's plankton, the basic building block of the global food chain. Without this food source, much of life in the sea would have starved to death. That, in my mind, is a most probable explanation of the extinctions in the oceans. The combination of the heat blast, fires, and ash cloud devastated life across the globe, all from a single asteroid impact. Some plants and animals actually survived, and it's a good thing because the age of mammals, which led to human evolution, would not have occurred. If the dinosaurs had not been wiped out, along with 75% of all the other plants and animals at the time, uh, we literally would not be here. Some other form of life, maybe intelligent, maybe not, would be, would be walking the planet. Based on what happened to the dinosaurs, many scientists believe another significant asteroid impact could exterminate the human race. That's why astronomers are scanning the skies, hoping to find an asteroid in time and protect us from the same fate as the dinosaurs. If an asteroid were headed toward Earth, depending on its size and position in the sky, we might not see it until it was too late. Asteroids entering our atmosphere are commonplace, and their beauty hides their underlying danger. Known as meteors as they impact our atmosphere, and meteorites when they reach the Earth's surface, asteroids near our planet range in size from tens of miles to a few inches across. These meteors are flying through the air just 50,000 feet away. That's closer to us than military spy planes and just a little higher than commercial jets. On a planetary scale, that's a razor thin margin and they are moving at nearly 40,000 miles per hour, 40 times faster than a speeding bullet. As the evidence grows that a killer asteroid could destroy our planet, the need to protect ourselves from asteroid impacts has become a priority. In 1995, the United States Congress commissioned Space Guard, a program that utilizes a collection of telescopes to scan the skies for potentially hazardous asteroids. We've come to realize that the Earth is, in fact, uh, running around the sun in this shooting gallery of uh, near-Earth objects. Near-Earth objects, called NEOs for short, are asteroids or comets that have been slowly moved by gravity out of the asteroid belt. 
Their new orbit brings them within 30 million miles of Earth, a third the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Astronomers predict there are 1,200 NEOs a half mile wide or larger, and hundreds of thousands of smaller ones. Well, we think there's uh, about 260,000 objects larger than a football field. A football field-sized asteroid would wipe out a city. But with limited resources, Space Guard's focus right now is on the ones that would cause a global catastrophe. The goal of the Space Guard project is to identify at least 90% of the one kilometer or larger objects that may potentially threaten the Earth. That leaves 10% or nearly 120 large asteroids that may not be identified by the end of the project in 2009. To date, there are just seven telescopes searching the night sky for NEOs. They are strategically positioned across the globe, five on the mainland of the US, one in Hawaii, and one in Australia. All the surveys working together cover the whole observable sky about now twice a month. At the Catalina Observatory outside Tucson, Arizona, astronomer Stephen Larson and his colleagues use an asteroid's motion to find NEOs. The most common technique is to image a field multiple times and compare the field for objects whose positions are moving or changing. Images of the same part of the sky are taken 10 minutes apart. Then, by animating these images, astronomers can identify an asteroid. Yeah, this is a near-Earth asteroid that was discovered yesterday by our other Schmidt telescope. It's a pretty bright, fast-moving object. It's uh, maybe half a kilometer, I think. It's an Earth crosser. Despite this rather simple form of surveillance, night after night, astronomers are cataloging dozens of new asteroids. Here's one now. It's got slightly unusual motion, but it's uh, pretty faint, not identified. It's probably never been seen before. To date, three NEOs have created concern for astronomers. Two of them may intersect the Earth's orbit at the beginning of the next century. The third one, nicknamed Apophis, poses a much greater threat. We did a quick orbit determination and noted that it's going to make a very close Earth approach on April 13th. Friday the 13th, in 2029. In fact, it's going to get within uh, five Earth radii of the Earth's surface, which is actually below the altitude of our geosynchronous communication satellites. So it's going to be one of the closest uh, near misses on record. Five Earth radii is 20,000 miles, just a sixth the distance to the moon. Astronomers are confident it will miss the Earth in 2029. But that's not the real risk. If Apophis passes through a tiny portion of space called a keyhole, its orbit could be changed with devastating results. When it makes its close approach to the Earth in 2029, should it pass within a 600 meter sized keyhole in space, then it will come around five times and then hit the Earth in 2036. The likelihood of Apophis threading the needle of this keyhole is very small. But if it were to hit, it would be catastrophic. Pophis is thought to be about 320 meters in extent, a little over three times the size of a football field. If it were to hit the Earth, uh, it, would be a, <laughs> it would be a big problem. It would be an explosion with a more, far more energy than any uh, nuclear armament we have. Since 1995, of the estimated large near-Earth objects thought to exist, 800 have been discovered. What I am worried about are the three or 400 objects I haven't even found yet. I cannot guarantee you that one of them will drop out of the sky tomorrow. The problem is the Space Guard methodology is far from perfect. The near-Earth asteroids that are swarming around the Earth, we, we find them kind of by chance. Just a matter of, of luck, whether a particular asteroid happens to be close enough when the telescope's pointed in that direction that it's bright enough to be detected by these relatively small telescopes. And the telescopes may have blind spots. The asteroids spotted by Space Guard are visible due to the reflection of sunlight as they circle the Earth. But certain orbits can hide an asteroid until the very last moment. 
You can imagine an object that was fairly good size sneaking up and uh, getting on an Earth-threatening trajectory, perhaps coming out of the sun, so you couldn't see it just before it hit. Most of the time, these hidden asteroids are small, and the friction with our atmosphere tears them apart. We're actually fortunate to be living on the Earth because we are enveloped in this wonderful atmosphere. This atmosphere actually protects us from most of the impact events that actually involve the Earth. Impacting asteroids and comets actually are destroyed as they try to punch through or penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. The real danger comes from those asteroids large enough or strong enough to blast through the Earth's atmosphere. The six-mile dinosaur killer was made of stone and made it through due to its immense size. The one which created America's most famous crater, Meteor Crater, was tiny by comparison, but much tougher. This is the world's best preserved, most pristine impact site. It's an immense crater, a three quarters of a mile, stretching from rim to rim. An iron asteroid 10 to 50 yards across came hurtling out of the sky. When that object hit the surface, it burrowed down a distance of about the same depth as its diameter. 50 yards is a relatively small asteroid, yet because it was made of iron, its impact proved to be enormous. It created an immense explosion, which actually excavated this immense bowl-shaped cavity, throwing 175 million metric tons of rock on the surrounding landscape. This material, now up on the rim of the crater, used to be far below me. The explosive energy of the impact event excavated this block up out of the crater and deposited it up here on the rim. The explosion was equal to the power of 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. If an iron asteroid the same size as the one that produced Meteor Crater were to hit the Earth, it has the explosive energy, the capacity to completely destroy a modern city. It might not destroy a city as large as Los Angeles, but it certainly has the capacity to destroy a more moderate-sized city like Kansas City. The meteor that created this crater was made of iron. A similar-sized asteroid made of stone, on the other hand, is more likely to fragment and would explode before hitting the Earth. Yet that doesn't mean it wouldn't create a catastrophe, like the asteroid that exploded in 1908 over the Siberian region of Tunguska. It was tens of meters in size, you know, maybe half the size of a football field. It uh, blew up about eight miles above the ground with an energy of tens of megatons. It was like a large nuclear weapon. Blew down a whole forest, left nothing on the ground. No crater, totally pulverized itself. When scientists explored the blast zone, they found 1,200 square miles of destruction, slightly less than the state of Rhode Island. This from an asteroid that never hit the ground. An asteroid's devastation is etched clearly in our past, but what about future encounters? What if a huge asteroid were approaching the Earth today? It's a worst case scenario. Millions could die. What if sometime in the future, an impending asteroid impact threatened millions of lives? A mission to protect the planet from another catastrophic impact would have to be put in motion. It's one of the few examples of natural disasters which are entirely preventable, and we have it in our power to actually do that. We're actually doing something about the near-Earth object threat, uh, unlike the dinosaurs, uh, who didn't have a space program, and they checked out early. If we find an asteroid that's headed our way, with a little planning, we'd be able to push the asteroid just a little bit so it wouldn't hit. Scientists have devised various methods for preventing a collision. Most try to gently nudge the asteroid from its impacting orbit, but not all. The most common suggestion is a nuclear bomb. That's a brute force method. Um, it, it could potentially work. But if you're not entirely successful, you may only partially destroy it. Or you may blow it apart into a whole bunch of small debris, so now rather than a single impactor hitting you, you've got a whole spray of buckshot coming at you. Instead of a nuclear bomb, some scientists suggest a technique using the Yarkovsky effect, a phenomenon similar to the way light causes this toy to spin. When you have a spinning body, 
the uh, sunlight impinges on the body, but then the rotation carries the heat around and the heat is radiated off in a different direction. You could use this effect, actually, to push on the asteroid. If you were to paint it white on one side and black on another, it's not going to reflect the light the same way that it did originally. The force of this radiated heat will slowly change the asteroid's rotation and its orbit, moving it away from an impact with Earth. I personally think that while this was an elegant piece of physics, I don't see the practicality of hauling up huge buckets of paint to paint the asteroid. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be our solution for moving asteroids unless there's great technological advances in painting. <laughs> Perhaps a more practical approach is a solar mirror. Drifting alongside the asteroid, a mirror can reflect a pinpoint of sunlight, heating water trapped in the stone, causing it to boil. That boiling off water acts like a little artificial cometary jet, if you will. It's like a little rocket motor that over time will also change and move the asteroid's orbit to, again, potentially make it miss the Earth. The sun's energy can be harnessed with a sail as well. Large, lightweight solar collectors can be attached to an asteroid. Then, like a gentle solar wind, sunlight can push the collectors, moving the asteroid out of its collision course with the Earth. There are ideas of using a low thrust propulsion device like a plasma engine to push on the asteroid or pull on it for a year or several years. The ones that were mentioned uh, years ago are mass drivers where you sit a machine on the surface of the asteroid and use electrostatic charges to throw rocks off one side and that introduces a thrust onto the asteroid. Another very elegant solution uh, has recently been discussed by astronauts Ed Liu and Stan Love. Their idea is essentially, if you will, a gravitational tractor. Imagine uh, a spacecraft like this, maybe weighing 20 tons, maybe 30 meters across. Imagine parking near maybe a 200 meter diameter asteroid. The gravity of the asteroid will want to slowly draw the spacecraft in toward it. Using your thrusters on the end of the spacecraft, you prevent that from happening. Rather than falling in toward the asteroid, we now hover above the asteroid, pulling the asteroid along with the spacecraft. The beauty of the tractor is it uses gravity to pull the asteroid out of its orbit without ever touching it. The deployment of the tractor, like all these techniques, would take years. I always say that there's three important things when dealing with near-Earth asteroids as threats. You've got to find them early, you've got to find them early, and you've got to find them early, because then we have the technology to deal with them, and uh, it's not a problem. We would need at least uh, 10, 20, maybe 30 years in advance to mount a, an effective mitigation campaign. Just as important as having sufficient warning is knowing the makeup of the target asteroid. To actually uh, prevent an asteroid from hitting the surface of the Earth, we have to know two general things. We have to know what it's made of, what its composition is. We also have to understand the strength of the object. An H5 Here on Earth, George Flynn and Dan Durda are testing an asteroid's strength using meteorites, fragments of asteroids that have reached the Earth's surface. We have here a sample of a ordinary chondrite meteorite, which is uh, one of the more common stony meteorites that falls on the planet. I'll put a little, little leader string on it to keep it from rotating. It won't actually affect the impact experiment in any way. They're using NASA's vertical gun range to determine how meteorites react during collisions. Look at it oriented so it hits on this face right there. In this vacuum chamber, tiny metallic pellets are shot at meteorite targets at 1,100 miles per hour. The scattering of impact debris is measured and the data is used to determine the strength of the rock. The preliminary results prove these rocky asteroids to be about twice as strong as volcanic rocks on Earth, strong enough to support a mass driver or solar sails. Five, four, to study asteroids firsthand in space, the U.S. launched the probe called NEAR. We have liftoff of the Delta rocket carrying the NEAR spacecraft bound for the asteroid heroes. In 1999, after a three-year journey, NEAR rendezvoused with a 21-mile-long asteroid named Eros. 
giving us our first close-up look at an asteroid. It was made of solid rock, similar to the ones used in the collision experiments, and covered with a thin layer of dust. These were the results scientists expected. But then, in 2006, the Japanese probe Hayabusa rendezvoused with a small nearby asteroid called Itokawa. The results were startling. Hayabusa raised more questions than an answer. We thought uh, small asteroids would be fairly smooth. They wouldn't have much in terms of surface rubble, or, or regolith as we call it. Well, that turned out to be all wrong. When we got there, the spacecraft showed images of a surface at high resolution, highest resolution we've had on any asteroid to date. And it's extremely rocky surface. The surface is covered with loose, rubbly material. There was no obvious impact craters. Hayabusa has forced astronomers to rethink their plans to deflect an incoming asteroid. Other than the gravity tractor, many of the proposed techniques would not work on a rubble pile like Itokawa. Mother Nature has a way of pulling the rug out from under our best theories and uh, say, <laughs> back to the drawing board, boys. It appears each asteroid, depending on its composition, will require its own mitigation technique, and all will demand plenty of advanced warning. But if time were short, there'd likely be no way to prevent a catastrophic impact. The only recourse is to begin massive evacuations, build shelters, ration food and water, and stockpile meat and grains. Then, hope it's enough when the moment of impact arrives. Now, using historical records and the latest in computer technology, you will witness the living hell when a killer asteroid strikes. It would be a one in a million chance, a mile wide asteroid hidden by the sun slipping through Space Guard's net of telescopes. If it were to happen, we might only have a week before it hits the Earth. Now the latest scientific information combined with lessons learned from past impacts put us on the front lines to witness the terror and devastation if an asteroid hit off the coast of Southern California. The horror of that event would be, I think, beyond anything that people have ever experienced in historical times. Like New Orleans in the path of Katrina, the entire population of Southern California from Santa Barbara to San Diego must flee the oncoming disaster. In Los Angeles, more than six million people pile onto three major highways, bringing traffic to a standstill. Tent cities are set up across the deserts. No one is saying it, but everyone knows these temporary shelters may not be temporary. As the last of the population try to leave the city, the impending doom can be spotted by the naked eye. Our first indication, just standing outside and looking up in the sky, for several nights before the impact, this object would, would grow from being simply one of the background stars in the sky, being brighter and brighter. Within a day or two before the impact, it would be the brightest star in the sky. Headed for the coast of Los Angeles, it ignites as it slams into the atmosphere. The fireball created as the object just approaches the surface and begins to vaporize and break apart that fireball is going to be something like 25 miles in diameter and viewed from, you know, 130 miles away. The fireball uh, would be so hot, it would be hotter than tens of suns glowing at you. It hits the ocean at nearly 30,000 miles per hour. Water there is about 3,000 meters deep, about a mile deep. And it would uh, basically blow away that water in a, a fraction of a second make a hole in the ocean that's about 20 miles across. So we'd basically blow all that water away. It would blow uh, all the way to the seafloor, and it would dig into the seafloor another five or six kilometers more. Then comes the heat wave from the explosion. It would be catastrophic. It'd be at least a million megatons of equivalent energy, uh, far larger than the total nuclear arsenal. Anything flammable spontaneously ignites. Buildings, vegetation, and people suffer serious burns. I have humans getting second degree burns out to at least 180 miles. Uh, the entire area between San Diego and Santa Barbara and 
from the shore near Los Angeles inland to past Pasadena, everything flammable would catch on fire. All this devastation occurs within the first few seconds after the impact. Then, earthquakes started by the asteroid's collision with the seafloor begin. And you would feel the seismic shaking. It would be equivalent to a magnitude 8 earthquake. It would be pretty serious shaking. It wouldn't destroy big buildings, but it would uh, shake, rattle, and roll wood frame houses. There will be a blast of high pressure air being blown away from the impact itself. Winds reach 300 miles per hour. So buildings would actually collapse, brick walls would be blown in, windows would be shattered. The winds subside in a few minutes, but then the debris begins to fall. The formation of that crater, a huge amount of water would have been ejected. Uh, into the Earth's atmosphere, and that would have come crashing back down onto the ocean surface around it, out to distances of another 12, 13, or 14 miles. The entire coast of Southern California is inundated with millions of gallons of seawater. About two or three minutes after the impact itself, we would start to be showered by a fuselage of gravel. That fuselage of gravel itself would, would be enough to kill you. Within 10 minutes, Los Angeles is obliterated. Santa Monica, Hollywood, Malibu are all turned to dust. And as if this weren't enough. Lastly, you get hit by big tsunami waves about a half hour later. Tsunami waves might be gigantic. They're hard to believe, even 200 meters high. So we're talking 10-story uh, buildings, more than that, way more than that. And it uh, wouldn't be just one, there would be uh, dozens and dozens of those waves. They would run in five miles. If you survived all the first things, you'd be washed away by those. So it's pretty horrific. We're talking serious stuff here. Uh, and the Indonesian tsunami made waves in the middle of the ocean of about a meter. We're talking waves in the middle of the ocean of 200 meters or so. Uh, it would be really quite huge. And these tsunamis reach every corner of the Pacific. 150 feet high as they hit Hawaii, 90 feet in Japan. Then the largest forest fire in California history begins. The Chicxulub impact tells us that smaller debris fall back to Earth, raising the atmospheric temperatures, turning it into an oven. Within minutes, the skies over Southern California turn red with burning debris, igniting fires across the landscape. Soon, most of Southern California is ablaze. Prevailing winds push the burning embers of what was Los Angeles toward the east, starting fires in Utah, Arizona, and north to Oregon. And like the dinosaur killer, a huge cloud of sulfur combines with the smoke of the fires and moves across the western hemisphere, darkening the sky into a perpetual dusk. The temperature begins to fall as little sunlight reaches the ground. A continental nuclear winter has begun. That has the capacity to dramatically alter agriculture, and agriculture, in fact, would have suffered for several years. If people half a world away think they are safe from the impact, they are wrong. The cloud of ash reduces temperatures across the continent, bringing frosts in July, killing off crops in America's Midwest, the world's breadbasket. Without this essential food supply, a global starvation ensues for years to come. People may survive in one part of the world but if people in large swaths of the Earth's surface do not have food, civilization can begin to break down. That is probably uh, the most important uh, effect of an impact event of this sort. And given that the planet has you know, over five billion people, the loss of a million people or two million people seems actually rather low to me. It, it would be uh, millions if not hundreds of millions of people. Hundreds of millions of people, one cosmic event, a single moment in time. It will take years for the debris cloud to disappear and the climate to recover. The human race will suffer unimaginable horrors, but will not be extinguished. Unlike the dinosaurs, our sheer numbers and technological capabilities may help us avoid their fate. Luckily, the chances of an asteroid threatening our planet are quite small. Yet with the stakes so high, stronger telescopes and innovative research are essential to guarantee our survival of this mega disaster. A 
America paralyzed by severe ice storms. Europe gripped by a frigid cold that drops like a bomb on the continent. Many experts believe that we are on the verge of an abrupt climate change, which could threaten our very survival. England, France, Germany would begin to resemble Alaska and Canada. Scientists project that within a few decades, the climate could radically spin out of control. If you're living on the edge, and you get just a little bit of a cooling, it can push you over the edge. There will be no time to adapt or recover from the deadly cold. Abrupt climate change is one of the great crises that our civilization could face. It's hard to overestimate the magnitude of the impact of this. Great civilizations have been destroyed by sudden and extreme climate changes. People take good weather for granted, and then nature changes things, and all of a sudden they're off a cliff without a net. Now the clock is ticking toward a big chill, a new climate catastrophe that could affect civilizations across the entire planet and unravel the very fabric of society. We are looking at an unending war in our future. The changes that are coming are beyond what we have learned to deal with. The Earth's climate is far more fragile than people think. It's subject to radical shifts that can be so quick and extreme that it can change the course of history. A potential big chill could be caused by something as subtle as a deviation in ocean currents in the North Atlantic. The climate catastrophe might begin with temperatures bouncing up and down from cold to hot and back for decades. Paradoxically, as the southern regions heat up, the northern areas become much colder. Some experts project a 10 degree drop in average winter temperatures in some areas. The results, freezing winter storms paralyze Western Europe. Stinging winter temperatures grip the eastern seaboard of the United States. Raging ice storms with high wind velocity batter New York. Temperatures continue to drop. Boston reels under the weight of the most brutal winter in its history. As the relentless winter persists, punishing snow and windy ice storms blanket the entire northeast coast. In Europe, the winters also stretch into months of unending freezing temperatures. London's cold, wet winters twist into a deadly series of ice storms. Paris is frozen in stark relief to what it once was. Berlin is a snowbound relic of the past. Some scientists predict that this sudden change in climate, including a big chill in the north, could occur within our lifetime. I think there are several things that people don't realize about the climate. First of all, that it is changing, that that, that is a given. Uh, and the only question is how fast and how far and where it will settle out. And that it can change rather dramatically. Ironically, the same shift in climate may cause not only near Arctic conditions, possibly creating a mini ice age in parts of North America and Europe, but also massive drought and more severe storms in other regions. It's not only the speed at which these climate changes will occur, some say within a decade, but also the unpredictable nature of the changes that make the impact potentially lethal. As we move into the future, if the climate state is such that we can have severe storms and severe weather events coming in every year or every other year, that's not normally what we deal with and that's not normally what society is prepared to cope with and adapting to that kind of extreme is very difficult. We don't know what to prepare for. One massive blizzard after another and no time to prepare or recover 
could be the new and deadly winterscape on the East Coast and Europe. Then the question really becomes, what's the climate of the United States? What is habitable on the Earth? This rapid change in climate has happened before. Scientists call this phenomenon abrupt climate change. A good working definition for an abrupt change is any change that occurs more rapidly than society's ability to respond to it. One of the most extreme examples of abrupt climate change occurred before the advent of modern civilization. About 14,000 years ago, the Earth was approaching the end of its last ice age. Groups of Stone Age hunter-gatherers roamed throughout Europe and Asia, foraging for food and game. But then suddenly, 1,200 years later, temperatures dropped as much as 18 degrees in less than a decade. The plants and animals upon which these early humans depended either died off or moved to warmer regions. The humans who survived migrated south. This radical drop in temperature is known as the Younger Dryas event, named after an Arctic flower found in ice cores in Greenland. The event known as the Younger Dryas is the poster child for abrupt climate change. What's interesting about this particular change is that the ice age had already ended and the Earth had already begun to warm and gone into its modern mode. As the weather began to warm, it suddenly flipped to freezing cold. Literally, the uh, climate shifted from maritime to Arctic over in the blink of an eye, and then stayed cold for 1,300 years, and then just as dramatically warm. And then we were officially into this modern interglacial warm climate epoch. And why it ended is not at all certain. Scientists believe that the Younger Dryas was caused by a change in ocean currents. It was one of the most extreme freezes since the end of the last ice age. The Younger Dryas is a dramatic example of how the climate can bounce rapidly like a bungee cord between deadly warm and cold extremes. It doesn't always go smoothly. Sometimes it goes boing, 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 and then it'll stabilize for a while uh, at cold, and then it'll start up and then it'll go boing, 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 and then it will stabilize for a while at warm. In the past, we've seen climate change like a light switch, where conditions flicked on and off, and these flicks occur extremely rapidly, and then we are in a new state. And that new climate state can be irreversible. We don't just go back. Following the end of the Younger Dryas, the Earth entered a protracted period of relatively temperate climate. But there have been instances of sudden chilling periods including what historians call the Little Ice Age. Between 900 and 1300 AD, you had what was called the medieval warm period. Merchants were getting rich enough to build castles. The weather was good. Population quadrupled in Europe. People were taller. They were living longer. Everything's going great. A thousand years ago, when the medieval warm period is on, you can take an open boat and you can sail across from Scandinavia to Iceland. You're not running into frozen ocean. You're not running into lots of icebergs. The seafaring Vikings took advantage of the good weather to establish farming and trading communities in Iceland. They expanded their territory, sailing their large ships to Greenland. And in 1000 AD or so, they moved into the New World. Um, and you know they weren't really pr prospering there, but they were there, and they had these two colonies in Greenland that were a staging area to get to the New World. Then, around 1300 AD, the weather mysteriously began changing. Historical data taken from crop yields and other public records show a small drop in temperature. But this minor degree change in temperature was enough to trigger the Little Ice Age. A prolonged period of colder weather in Europe that would have disastrous consequences. Ultimately, this slight shift in climate would play a part in the spread of the Black Death and the social upheavals that would lead to the American and French revolutions. Researchers from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution look for clues about past climate change by digging sediment cores from the ocean floor they have discovered intriguing evidence of the Little Ice Age. 
the seafloor is a repository for uh, for shells of animals that grew in the overlying waters and for, th and for sediments that wash off land. And these layers accumulate in the cores and we get a record that might be 100,000 or even a million years long. Samples of the mud reveal a snapshot of the past climate records, including extreme changes like the Little Ice Age. We have records of sea surface temperature, of deep ocean temperature, of salinity. We have records of uh, volcanism, solar activity. There's, there's countless things that can be measured here. The samples are then radiocarbon dated in a particle accelerator. Radiocarbon dating is a tool that allows us to tie together climate records and changes in the Earth's system from sediment cores and link those to the historical record as far back as 40,000 years. So we've dated the bottom of the core at about 1,700 years before present. And at that time, this was the seafloor. So sediment is continually accumulating 1,700 years, 1,500 years, 1,000 years. 500 years ago here, about the beginning of the Little Ice Age, right up to today. And you know, if you go back in 100 years from now, there'll probably be a few more centimeters of sediment accumulated at this location. The subtle difference in the color of the mud shows microscopic data pointing to a change in ocean currents during the Little Ice Age. This evidence from the ocean itself corroborates a one-half to three degree drop in average temperature. But this small difference in temperature was the catalyst for a shattering climate disaster that changed the course of history and left millions dead. Some scientists predict a sudden, violent change in climate might lead to a big chill. Freezing temperatures will grip Europe and the northeastern coast of the United States. Life will come to a standstill in a terrifying frozen wasteland. It has happened before. Generations had prospered in the stable weather of pre-Renaissance Europe. But in the 1300s, without warning, that predictable world was turned upside down by the so-called Little Ice Age. One of the things that happened was that you had this whipsaw of going to warm, going to cold. 1309 was cold, 1315 was warm, 1317 was cold again. And creatures and uh, other things respond in different ways. You know, you get crops rotting in the field if it gets too wet or germinating too early or never germinating at all. The climate rapidly switched back and forth between cold and warm, wet and dry. But this initial erratic climate was only a prelude to catastrophic changes of epic proportions. Over the next few centuries, the weather continually fluctuated at temperatures between 0.5 and 3 degrees lower than normal. This small change was enough to awaken an icy killer. Throughout the Alps and throughout parts of Europe, and in fact in North America, in Canada, the Eastern Canadian Arctic, we see evidence that during the Little Ice Age, glaciers advance. The difference of only a few degrees triggered a self-perpetuating feedback cycle. You make a little more ice, it reflects more of the sun. By reflecting the sun, the sun is not warming us up, and so it gets colder, so you make more ice. As the glaciers expanded, the Vikings took the first brunt of the climate's deadly chill. They switched from being a farming economy to eating a lot from the sea because they were having troubles raising enough uh, things on their farms, apparently. But as temperatures continued to drop, storms and freezing winds blasted the settlements. Even the sea held no hope of survival for the starving Vikings. Around Iceland, sea ice expanded and the, uh, the people couldn't get out and go fishing. And they had open boats, not boats with decks, so they were particularly vulnerable to bad weather. After decades of expansion, 
battle axe wielding, pillaging, and plundering Vikings were defeated by a sudden drop in temperature. Well, 10 super cold years, including one of the coldest years on record ever in about 1355 AD, shut down the Western colony. And 100 years later, the more southerly Eastern colony shut down. The Vikings who survived migrated south, assimilating into populations living in continental Europe. Their fearless culture receded into history. If it hadn't been for the Little Ice Age, the Vikings may have continued settling in the New World, and today's America would be a very different place. By the end of the 14th century, Europe was buckling under freezing temperatures all winter long. In a chain reaction ignited by the cold and stormy weather, one calamity followed another. Crops failed, and food shortages spread across Europe. The freezing cold blasted through Asia, but that was only the beginning. Relentless storms killed at least seven million. The resulting floods produced a horrific and infamous blowback effect on Europe. Everybody's familiar with the Black Death, uh, but the lesser known story, of course, is the role that climate may have played in unleashing it. The Black Death, or the Plague, was a devastating pandemic that ravaged Europe during the mid 14th century. The drop in temperature changed weather conditions, causing storm patterns to shift and intensify. In the early 1300s, Asia had a record-breaking series of torrential storms and subsequent flooding. Rats carrying the plague thrived in these conditions. The animals that react the first are the ones that reproduce by the zillions and reproduce very rapidly, whereas the longer-lived, slower-reproducing animals tend to lag, and, and so weedy species of, ver of every sort seem to take advantage of climate change and flourish. Rats on ships traveling the trade routes spread the disease from Asia to Europe. An already starving and weakened population was no match for the Black Death. Within five years, the plague had killed between 25 and 34 million people in Europe, one third of the population. An estimated 40 million more died in North Africa and Asia. Generation after generation suffered the relentless pounding of extreme cold and wet weather, pushing the starving peasant to his limit. Then there are intense storms and incessant rain. Crops are rotting in the field. There's so little sunlight that he can't make salt in the summer to preserve anything. Diseases, molds, blights, and everything else are beginning to afflict him. People fell into robbery, they lost their lands, starvation, they started eating their livestock, dogs and cats, and at some points they even ate each other. Sophisticated European societies quickly crumbled, scratching at the edges of mere survival. Starving peasants revolted against the aristocracy. The political unrest and an economic crash in England were factors in the American Revolution. And it was the poor of 1789 France that fueled the French Revolution. The tragic scope of the Little Ice Age was staggering. Millions died horrible deaths simply because the temperature dropped a few degrees. If you're living on the edge and you get just a little bit of a cooling, it, it can push you over the edge. Little changes in global temperatures can have an enormous effect. A temperature change of five to nine degrees, which is also um, within the realm of possibility, would just be unimaginable. The small drop in temperature that triggered the Little Ice Age may have been caused by a dimming of solar output, linked to a change in sunspot activity. Another factor that intensified the cooling was something else no one could have predicted or prevented. During the Little Ice Age, at least three massive volcanoes erupted. Mount Vesuvius in 1631, Mount Tambora in 1815, 
and Krakatoa in 1883. All spewed particles and gases into the upper atmosphere. These particulates reflected the sunlight back into the atmosphere, cooling the Earth. If you put a lot of volcanic debris high into the northern hemisphere, it's going to be everywhere in the northern hemisphere within just a couple of years. No matter what part of the Earth is facing the sun day or night, it's still going to get less sunlight. After six centuries of death and deprivation, the weather finally began to warm. So the Little Ice Age likely ends um, because the volcanoes quiet down, they're not blocking the sun, and the sun brightens up a little bit. So you have warming um, coming out of 1850 or 1900 into the early part of the 1900s. The Little Ice Age may be over, but some scientists see it as a preview of what could occur again. This time, with even more devastating consequences. Experts believe that in the future, a big chill could create a series of catastrophic weather events. From freezing blizzards blanketing London, to an eerily empty New York buried in snow, to a drought-ridden Midwest. But this would not be the first time that dramatic climate changes threatened an entire way of life. Since the end of the Younger Dryas about 11,500 years ago, our world has had a relatively temperate climate, providing a foundation for the growth of modern civilizations. But within this time, scientists have uncovered other periods where average temperatures flicker on and off between coolings and warmings. As we look back, over the last 10,000 years, most of the coolings have been fairly small. While Europe's Little Ice Age caused widespread deprivation and death, it did not mean the end of civilization. But there have been rare episodes when extreme changes in temperature have literally destroyed entire societies. Just such a change may have caused the collapse of the great Mayan Empire. As of 900 AD, the Mayan civilization had been around for about 1,200 years. It had risen and fallen several times before that, but it always bounced back. 900 AD, it disappeared and it never came back. So there's been great speculation about what did in the Mayans. The fall of the Mayan civilization of three million people may have been one of the most striking examples of a deadly climate disaster. Tucked in the rainforests of what is now Central America, the early Mayans developed a sophisticated urban society. Without the use of iron or the wheel, the Mayans built sprawling cities, each with large plazas surrounded by majestic temples and pyramids. Why this advanced civilization disappeared has been a mystery for centuries. Many archaeologists speculated that the Mayans imploded with civil unrest. Warring factions overtook civil society, and the fragile social structure collapsed in chaos. There's over 100 different theories of the Mayan decline, most of them being that they did it to themselves because they were a somewhat cruel civilization in some respects. But there were other natural forces at work that were beyond the power of the Mayans to control or understand. Recent research in climate history has revealed a new angle on an old mystery. Researchers are still investigating, but some believe that a minute lowering in global temperatures may have triggered the end of the Mayan Empire. The biggest challenge for the Mayans was how to manage their water supply through the wet, rainy seasons and the occasional droughts. In different regions of the Mayan civilization, the cities were built near natural water sources such as sinkholes where water would be collected naturally and be available even through the dry season. 
but in some parts of the region, groundwater was inaccessible. With access to groundwater limited, the Mayans were dependent upon rain as a source of fresh water. In order to efficiently utilize this precious resource, the Mayans built an intricate system of canals to irrigate their farms and cities. With the help of steady rains, the Mayans evolved from a mere subsistence society to a flourishing, sophisticated culture with an avid interest in literature, art, mathematics, and astronomy. The Mayans charted the orbits of the stars through their observatories, even orienting their religious buildings along astronomical lines. But the Mayans had no way of knowing that their magnificent culture would come to a crashing end, all because of a change that they themselves may have noted. What you see is a recurrent pattern in history in which people take good weather for granted, they're fruitful, they multiply, they expand beyond the carrying capacity of the land, essentially. For hundreds of years, the mighty Mayan people depended on the predictable rain cycle to sustain their vast empire in Central America. Then they were hit by extended periods of devastating drought. Paradoxically, their drought may have come about as a result of a drop in global temperature. Some suggest that Mayan astronomers themselves noticed a slight change in the appearance of the sun. Some researchers believe that there had been a reduction in solar radiation hitting the planet's surface, causing a shift in wind patterns. In the north, temperatures may have cooled, but for the Mayans, the effect was the opposite. Rain clouds stayed south, creating a devastating drought in the Yucatan. We've been able to identify periods of three or six or nine years in a row where the rainy season failed to come. And each one of these intervals of drought coincides with a period of major collapse in one of the regions of the Mayan civilization. As the droughts continued, the rulers began to lose their grip on the people. As they failed to deliver on their promises of water in the dry months and the reservoirs would not be replenished adequately during the summer, farmers themselves started to move away. Many scientists speculate that the warring Mayan civilization was already beginning to collapse. Deforestation, rampant disease, and their own warlike culture contributed to their demise. But the actual tipping point may have been the change in climate. These bad, severe drought events occurring over several years in a row could have ultimately resulted in the civilization no longer being able to deal with these societal stresses. The drought events could easily be an explanation for what caused the Maya ultimately to disappear entirely. The Mayan Empire was left in ruins leaving only their grand pyramids in silent testimony to who they once were. Could we be the next victims of an extreme climate catastrophe? Experts warn that a temperature drop of only a few degrees could catapult parts of the northern hemisphere into a new little ice age within just a few decades. The relatively mild winters of the eastern seaboard and western Europe could warp into icy, barren landscapes. Scientists believe that the next big chill would have its beginning in the oceans. 70% of the Earth's surface is ocean. 90% of all rain falls into the seas. It is a colossal reservoir of water, carrying heat all over the planet. A huge ocean current system, known as the thermohaline circulation, which includes the Gulf Stream, circulates warm water north from the equator. 
giving our northeastern seaboard and parts of Europe relatively temperate climates. London, England and Calgary, Canada are on the same latitude, yet London is much warmer on average. The reason? The thermohaline circulation, which brings warm water and warm air north to the British Isles. As the heat is absorbed into the atmosphere, the surface water becomes colder, saltier, and dense. It sinks deeply, in effect pulling the current down behind it. So in the winter, as, as the water gets really cold, colder makes it contract, and contracting makes it denser, and then it sinks. And then warm water flows up to replace it. In a self-perpetuating cycle, the thermohaline circulation then moves south, where it warms again at the equator and continues its cycle back up north. This immense system is dependent upon a delicate balance between warm and cold water and fresh and salt water. Disrupt any part of the system and you could create a mini ice age in parts of the northern hemisphere. And there's one change already happening. Global warming is raising sea temperatures. The oceans are warming. Almost all the glaciers on the planet have gotten smaller over the last hundred years. You're getting reductions in sea ice in the Arctic. Things are happening earlier in the spring and lasting farther into the fall than they did in the past. And so there's this great number of indicators that say, yes, the planet is warming. This rise in the ocean temperatures may cause a shutdown of the thermohaline circulation, the system that brings warmth to the North Atlantic region. The total heat capacity of the ocean is 1,100 times that of the atmosphere. So in my mind, we really should be trying to understand what's going on in the ocean to understand our future climate. Researchers from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution utilize many tools to study the changing ocean. Remote control devices called floaters track changes in the ocean's condition. They're sort of like weather balloons for the ocean that drift at depth for 10 days, then come to the surface, recording the temperature and salinity as they rise, and they transmit that data to a satellite. And we have a program to deploy thousands of these around the global ocean, and thereby, for the first time, monitor the ocean heat and salt content on a continuous basis. This is a revolutionary new tool for seeing climate processes acting in the ocean. Using the data transmitted by tools like floaters, scientists create computer models that track and then project climate changes. Recently, researchers have found evidence of a disturbing development. Global warming is melting glaciers and ice sheets causing an increase in fresh water flowing into the thermohaline circulation, a process they call freshening. This fresh water could throw off the critical balance between temperature and salinity that powers the thermohaline circulation. What it means is that those warm waters no longer flow north, and they stop much further south, and so all that warmth that would otherwise warm the northern hemisphere stays in the south, which means, for example, there's more energy in the atmosphere there, more extreme storms and so on, but critically, much colder in the north. If the thermohaline circulation is disrupted, an abrupt climate change as intense as the Little Ice Age could result. Temperatures could drop dramatically in the North Atlantic in as little as a decade. If the thermohaline circulation was to shut down, the average temperature changes resulting of that could be anywhere between 8 to 12 degrees, possibly, but that would be on average. And clearly, the extremes that could result from an average temperature change like that could be well beyond that. England, France, Germany would begin to resemble Alaska and Canada. And those parts of the world, uh, particularly Alaska, might even get colder still. In the United States, the northeast coast would be hit the hardest, 
with extreme temperatures and more intense blizzards and storms. For example, severity of nor'easter storms could easily increase in a condition where you had increased storminess, increased wind velocities impacting the eastern North America. But this big chill in the northern regions of Europe and America would only be a side effect of the real devastation in other parts of the world. In the Pacific, a warmer ocean will intensify the El Nino rainstorm cycle that historically batters the Pacific coastline. Even a two degree change, if we were so lucky, um, would be double the intensity or more of the strongest El Nino we've ever felt. In 1998, there was a very strong El Nino. It did $100 billion damage around the world and killed tens of thousands of people. So even a very slight variation from the norm in global weather can cause a lot of damage. In the South Atlantic, warmer oceans will mean intensified hurricanes and massive storms. The fact that we have a great deal of heat built up in the ocean means that there's plenty of fuel for more intense hurricanes. So it seems inevitable that strong hurricanes are in our future. If we get not just one Katrina, but if we get five Katrinas per year coming into different regions of the Gulf Coast, or in fact shifting to where now these storms are impacting along the eastern seaboard and coming into Washington, D.C. and New York City, then the consequences would be severe. Next, using the latest in scientific data and computer visualizations, we get a terrifying glimpse at the impact of extreme and abrupt climate change in our future. Not just freezing temperatures in the north, but also monster hurricanes, massive storms, and in some areas, endless drought. If you look at the potential for the damage done by climate change, you can easily see how climate change could be a weapon of mass destruction. From the Younger Dryas event over 12,000 years ago to the more recent Little Ice Age, extreme climate change has had catastrophic effects on humankind. These climate changes that may occur in the future are not something that we can say, oops, we don't mean it, we want to go back now. We may enter a place where, in fact, the thermohaline circulation has shifted. And in the past, we've seen that those conditions have lasted for thousands of years. Using the latest research, expert predictions, and computer animation, we will now show how this worst case scenario might unfold. This abrupt climate change is triggered when warming temperatures cause the polar ice sheets to melt. Fresh water melting from the glaciers interrupts the delicate balance of the thermohaline circulation, shutting off warmth to the North Atlantic. Average temperatures in Europe and North America slide dangerously down. With the Gulf Stream no longer warming the Atlantic seaboard, winters are much more severe along the northeast coast of the United States. On the whole, the further north we get will be colder, drier, and windier. And you begin to think of everything kind of north of the Mason-Dixon line beginning to look like Siberia. Frankly, the habitability of some of the major northern cities begins to diminish. In New York, winter temperatures could begin as early as October. By November, snowfall in New York City could reach record-breaking levels. You could have already increased winter storminess affecting New York City, and what could be a normally paralyzing two feet of snowfall could become six feet of snowfall. Wind velocity increases and storms batter the coast. The Statue of Liberty is no longer a beacon of freedom, but a frozen marker for a once vibrant city. Europe's urban centers, particularly London, reel under frigid windstorms and freezing temperatures. Suddenly Britain, which is already tough enough in the winter, becomes really miserable in the winter and has no summers, and uh, suddenly begins to get much, much colder. For the first time in more than a century, the Thames freezes over. 
This sudden and extreme climate change could subject Europe and the northeastern United States to overwhelming winters for centuries to come. The same warmer oceans that lead to a big chill in the north will bring catastrophic changes across the planet. Changes that will affect every person, every nation, and every form of weather. They will be just as devastating as any chilling effect. In the west, warmer oceans lead to persistent El Ninos. Storms pound the Pacific coastlines with torrential rains all winter long. The San Gabriel Mountains on the north side of the Los Angeles Basin are one of the steepest mountain ranges in America. With a powerful El Nino condition, Los Angeles could be buried by thick mudslides. These things increase exponentially, so the amount of runoff could increase exponentially. We're talking about 10 times more and then 100 times more. So the ability of these mudslides to affect entire parts of the city is not impossible. The streets of Los Angeles become rivers of mud and flood water, crushing everything in their paths. Ironically, the coastal deluges caused by the El Nino condition will have an opposite impact on the interior of the continent, bringing devastating droughts. The breadbasket of the American Midwest disappears. Like many other high crop yield regions in Canada, India, and the North China Plain, year after year of drought erodes the land. We have six billion people getting 40% of their sustenance from essentially five staple crops grown in just a few bread baskets around the world. So if drought actually does intensify in those bread baskets, we have 90 food importing nations that are gonna have big trouble feeding their people. Warmer oceans create powerful storms. Hurricanes and cyclones reach extraordinary strength. Most places in the world, people live within about 100 miles of the ocean. It doesn't matter where we are, uh, the, the population uh, lives close to the sea. Uh, it's in China and Japan, and Europe and America and Africa, everywhere. And those are the places that are most vulnerable to uh, climate disruption. They're the ones that are gonna be hit the hardest. One catastrophe slams into another, like a pinball hitting its target and ricocheting to the next. And so you envision a situation where you have the West coping with its water problems, the hurricane zone coping with hurricanes, the Northeast coping not just with windstorms, but with hailstorms and ice storms, which are also imposed a burden. The Midwest coping with swarms of tornadoes, which causes an enormous amount of uh, insurable damage. Scientists estimate that the carrying capacity of the planet, how many people its natural resources can actually sustain, is approximately 8 billion. Some projections indicate that catastrophic climate change could reduce the carrying capacity to 2 billion people. Only a third of the world's current population would be able to survive. As we've seen throughout human history, it is changes in carrying capacity that lead to war. When people exhaust their local ecosystems, the first thing they do is raid their neighbors. And in this case, we'll be fighting it out over food and water. Six billion people are gonna to have to get off the planet. And the way six billion people get off the planet is war. This is why I think climate change is so urgent. I mean, it's a recipe for conflict. If we fail in preventing the worst case scenario, we are looking at an unending war in our future. This vision of the future is a terrifying world where the climate we all depend on suddenly turns against us. A horrific existence where only the strongest and the luckiest survive. There still may be time to take steps to avoid this fate. If not, we, like other civilizations before us, may fall victim to the implacable force of nature and a catastrophic climate change. If we have long-term changes and increased extremes coming from multiple different sources, this is where we may be in for real surprises, and our society does not deal well with surprises.